Uh, thank you, Tanda, for that very kind uh, introduction. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're warm and safe as we start this. We've got quite a bit of ground to cover, so I'm just going to jump straight in and get going. So, yeah, a very uh, impressive uh, subtitle, Qualitative Adaptation to Climate Change. But really, it's just a fancy way of thinking, how, how do we make people sustainable in dealing with climate change? So without further ado, let me give you some context around this. Throughout this webinar, I'm going to apply this lens. Uh, it's called the Golden Circle Lens. It primarily asks three questions and in a specific sequence. Why, how, and what? Why do we struggle with climate change? How do we need to go about it? And what do we eventually need to um, put into place to get past all of this? So I'm going to do a little swing through um, what COVID is presenting to us right now in relation to climate change. So COVID really is, is the warm-up event for, for climate change. It's, it's the teaching that we can all use in dealing with it, the much larger issue. So COVID is kind of like a black swan, really. You know, it's, it's that unpredictable event that has high post-normal um, potential. But climate change in relation to that is really the black elephant. You know, it's that thing that we have always known about, um, but we've ignored. And then it will come in and smash the place up, and then we'll all be surprised and call it a black swan. Well, that's not really the case. So moving forward, let's put it into context then around what the actual realities for, for climate change are in our own country. Well, we're living in the Anthropocene, which means it's an epoch where human behavior is the primary factor in terms of our environment. And it is endangering conditions that sustain life. This is a result of 150 years of industrialization, and of course, as a country, we are on this carbon treadmill as a developing nation. We have to burn coal, we have to use oil, and we're a little bit behind the curve as, as far as technology is concerned. So we're kind of in a little bit of a trap around this. The problem is a two Celsius increase is going to give us runaway global warming. So we're about at 1.5, sorry, 1.5 degrees at the moment. But South Africa's particular problem is that we're warming at twice the rate of, of the global average. So we are moving very fast compared to the rest of the world, and we're getting very close to this edge. What it means for us socially, of course, is that uh, climate inequality and social uh, inequality are pretty much the same thing in South Africa. And I'll speak more about this later, but this is an important part of how we have to deal with climate change going forward. It affects our food seed, water, and energy sovereignty, our ability to keep the lights on, to feed ourselves, to have enough water to keep our industries going and so forth. So it's, however, our current energy policy is very carbon intensive. If you consider what's been put out um, by uh, Minister Gwedi Mantashi of late, um, terms like clean coal, not really clean, can never be. Coal is coal, carbon is carbon, but we're still playing these uh, games around terminology when there's actually much serious work to be done. So not to sound very dramatic this morning, but if we don't get this right, we are definitely going to see the end of our species in our lifetime. If you're under 70 years of age at the moment, this will happen in your lifetime if we don't get on top of it. So here's a chart. It's done by the University of Chani which gives us an indication of what temperatures are going to do in the next 10 to 20 years, as well as what our rainfall patterns are going to be. So if you look on the left, you will see that South Africa currently has a nice coastal belt, which is relatively cool and relatively wet. By 2030, the picture on the right is going to be our reality. We're going to be very hot. We're going to be very dry. So for instance, if one looks at... Um, industrial agriculture, for instance, um, cattle farming in particular. A lot of farmers are now starting to prepare to move away from cattle farming, from beef, um, and going on to game. And the reason for that is, well, cattle will stand outside in the sun and basically just burn to death, whereas wild uh, animals, game in particular, game meat, uh, they will find shade and they'll find water because they're already uh, predisposed uh, for doing that. 
So this is just one of the, the changes we can anticipate going forward in the next 10 to 20 years. But let's deal with the concepts around this because we really want to talk about people this morning, why we struggle to get our heads around climate change. Well, first of all, we're now living in a very uncertain and an insecure period in human history. It's what we call reflexive modernity. We've got many global risks, there are many changes. We all talk about the VUCA world today, but of course it's putting a lot of strain on our experts and our policymakers um, to develop an appropriate risk response. Meanwhile, for the rest of us, the, the average people in the street, so to speak, we're starting to have build up enormous anxiety around this, what we perceive to be a world that is beyond controllability. So there's New York, just an iconic picture. This could be New York in 20 years' time, looking like Venice. The iconic yellow cab is now going to be a boat. We've seen this happen during uh, Hurricane Sandy, where large-scale flooding happened. Low-lying areas are going to obviously be affected. However, a couple of years past that, and we've completely forgotten about that. So why do we do this? Why do human beings respond in this way? Well, we tend to discount the importance of the future versus the present. So what happens today occupies our minds completely, and we struggle to put it in relation to the future. So very often one hears comments like, yes, well, I've got to do what I've got to do today. I'm alive today. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Well, unfortunately, climate change doesn't go away. It's an all-the-time thing. The other thing that complicates it, of course, is we would rather avoid a loss today than seek a gain in the future. Um, if it costs us money today, we tend to switch off. We'd rather say, I'll pay more in the future. Well, the thing is, we're going to have to pay a lot more if we leave it for much longer. We also are prone to succumbing to this thing called single-action bias. So we'll take one action and we'll say, all right, that's my bit. I've done my bit for climate change. I've gone home. I've put some low energy light bulbs in my ceilings. Now I'm done. Now the next person can do their bit. Well, it's really not enough because straight after that, we could potentially go into an action that undoes that single action um, that was positive. And we'll do some more on this later in the, in the webinar. The other thing that we can also consider is making use of what we call the default effect, which is taking advantage of people's tendency to take the first available option. So if we say to folks, you know, here's a nice big fat button that, that you can just click on and you can donate um, a rand to a worthy cause, well, we can do the same with climate choices. Um, I'll always use the example here of Amazon Smile. You know, if you order something online from them, there's an opportunity where you can donate or Amazon will donate half a percent of your purchase to the charity of your choice. In my case, I, I selected the World Wildlife Fund to, to receive that money. But the point is made that we need to make this easier for people to understand and to select so we can start seeing some movement on, on climate change. In terms of approach, what then makes people put this in the background, push it away, down the line, kicking the can down the line? Well, we've developed this psyche where we believe that in terms of climate, what we need to see happen and what happens of a, as a consequence moves in a, in a straight line. Well, that's not in fact the case. There's a secondary process that takes place. People want to understand what it means to them before they move on to how they feel about it and then ultimately decide what they're going to do about it. So decision makers, um, Policy planners and the like tend to see this as a linear issue, but they forget that the human being gets involved in this and it moves everything underneath a psychological waterline, so to speak, and then it only pops up at the end and it usually looks quite different to, to what is planned. This then leads to what we call the promotion versus prevention dynamic. So in simple language, that will be people that are for change and people that are against change. And why do, we, and why do we see this so often in, in life? Well, it's quite simple. Along this axis of leveraging trust, the, the promotion crowd say, well, we need to support the future. Therefore, we have to entertain change. Whereas the status quo crowd says, well, no, we've got to defend the present. We can't, 
we can't let things become worse. So it becomes an argument between maximizing gains and minimizing losses. But as this dialogue continues, it actually comes together in a consensus position where there's very little difference between promoting the good and preventing the bad around climate change, and in particular to human behavior related to that. So we are on the way to the same place. We just have different perspectives on how to get there. That means we need to now look at how we interpret reality. What do we understand the role of our perceptions playing in all of this? So I'm going to use Hegel's synthesis model here. Well-known German philosopher, he codified this particular aspect of, of perception um, already in the 17th century. So basically, his thesis is very simple. You have an idea, and over time, very short time usually, the, the opposite idea comes to the fore, the antithesis. And then as this dynamic happens and the dialogue continues and the conversations take place, they start synthesizing. We, we converge in a consensus position. And then we end up with what we call synthesis. So here you can see, I'll just put my cursor on there, these two elements then become that. That then eventually leads to that. And, and so this, uh, this process unfolds continuously. We're all on this continuous uh, path of becoming. There, in fact, are no solutions to climate change. There are only next steps that we have to take because we are on this uh, infinite continuum going forward. However, that's not so simple because we all experience reality quite differently. So an event takes place, for instance, and then we form an interpretation around an event. That then becomes our truth, so to speak, and then we treat it as a fact. And this is often referred to as the freedom model. Now, you can imagine seven and a half billion people on the planet doing this, let's say, for argument's sake, three, four, five times a day. You know, these are trillions of actions and reactions that are taking place globally every single day. So what does that then say about our psyche and how we need to be in the world in order to deal with climate change? Well, our psychological change is happening at a far more rapid pace than cognitive change. Our emotions are overtaking our thoughts. But that's why we're mostly anxious or we are mostly unconscious. We are ignorant, uh, living in the bliss of ignorance. Either way, our emotions are now driving our response to climate change far more effectively than our thoughts. That means from a human perspective, uh, a lot of anxiety. Um, so our emotional system gets overloaded and we need some kind of a container. We need some kind of meaning uh, around this to make us feel that we have the ability to deal with this. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, um, a lot of people are saying, I'm too small, I'm too ineffective, I don't have the authority, all sorts of reasons why we can't take action around climate change. And we miss the larger picture that collective action is made up of individual actions. So we need to organize. And on that point, we have now seen uh, the lead being taken by the youth, Globally, Greta Thunberg is obviously the, the prime example of this. Everybody knows about her. She's got a high profile. But it's, it's very simple. And her constant refrain is also very simple. Young people are going to inherit the world. And the current and the previous generation have left it in a very bad state. So urgent action is required. However, that sometimes has a blowback effect. If we look on the bottom left, you'll see that if we continuously arouse fear and anxiety, it actually feeds denial. People go into a state of emotional numbness about this. They, they say, you know, it's enough. I can't deal with this all the time. And they shut down, which is something that we obviously want to prevent. The other thing that we also need to watch out for is um, climate deniers paying the comfort card, you know, scaring up ghosts and saying, well, you know, do you, are you ready to give up that gas guzzling SUV? Are you willing to, you know, only use electricity for half a day um, in your daily affairs? And so forth and so on. You know, flying around the world, those overseas holidays, forget about those. So they set it up as a binary that we have to choose between the two. 
in fact, what we can do is we can transition out of the things that are bad for our climate, and we can still have a lot of the benefits that we've accrued with them. However, we shouldn't lend our ears out to the crowd that say, you know, technology is going to save us. Some technological superhero is going to come along, swoop in and solve the problem for us. I mean, one of the craziest ideas I've heard of late is to put mirrors in space in a, in a stratosphere to deflect sunlight so that the polar ice caps don't melt. Well, then what happens to plant life on the planet? Plants need sunlight to photosynthesize, to grow. You know, there goes our food source. 80% uh, of our food comes from, from uh, plants. So we need to be very careful um, to jump into these knee-jerk reactions. This is a long-term problem, and we need to think long-term about it. So let's specifically talk about the barriers in um, to climate change, specifically the the psychological barriers. So I've already spoken about this environmental numbness, tuning out the message. But there's also just plain old-fashioned ignorance. Um, there's still a lot of people that don't even know what climate change is all about and what it can do to us. Discounting, another one, avoiding current loss over future again. We've, we've discussed that. So I'm going to move on to the second one, ideologies. And this is a particularly tough problem. Uh, this is a battle for ideas. And, you know, by its very nature, it means that the primacy of ideas have to reject other ideas. We see this um, argument quite often when climate change comes up in a religious or in a political context. There are lots of different opinions and, and very little agreement. Lots of talking and not so much listening. And then the techno-salvation, we've covered that. Um, so let's move on then to comparisons. Sociability, you know, we we social creatures. We like to compare ourselves with, with other people. But that makes us follow the herd. You know, we, we're not very good at, at pushing back against things that we don't agree with because, you know, we want to fit in. And that brings us to the final problem around comparisons or making comparisons. If we make changes, we want to be in a crowd that make change. We don't want to be the only ones doing it and then have a lot of free riders that, um, that get advantage out of that. So often we don't take action because we, we feel that or we fear being victimized by free riders. Sun costs. This is something that is very prevalent in the corporate sector. I hear this all the time wherever I go. Executives are all saying, but, you know, I've spent all of this money. How am I going to get it back? You know, if you're in the fossil fuel industry, sometimes you're on a 30 to a 40-year development double timeline. Um, what that primarily does for the executive is it creates this conflict, you know, how can I balance those things? How can I still keep my company going, but also take care of the climate? It brings eco-value conflict. Uh, we tend to push that down. Profit is primary. We'll wait it out. The next guy who comes along will be taking care of the problem and so on. And then we get into this thing called cognitive dissonance. You know, we are confronted by a reality, but we don't want to change our behavior. So think Donald Trump here. He's probably the poster child for this. You know, started his administration with this term called fake news, alternative facts, witch hunts, and the like. And that's simply a behavior that doesn't want to change. So change the reality. Rationalize it away. Discredence, mistrust. You know, how many times do we mistrust that the other person's going to do what we agree that we're going to do? Well, it's very often the case. Uh, we live in a world where trust is very low at the moment. We also don't like our freedoms being threatened. Um, so we push back against these things, unnecessarily so, because the bigger threat does not go away as a result of that. And then perceived risk. You know, will any of this work? Um, are we going to get the investment back? You know, will we have wasted our time at the end of it? Uh, will there be reputational damage if you're a business? There are perceived risks, but we need to be very clear. We need to be very cogent around this, and we need to put it in a relative sense compared to what 
ultimately could transpire if we don't take action. And then lastly, limited behavior is a very big barrier. We've talked about the single action bias, just doing one little thing and then undoing it with the very next action. You know, going on a long flight, coming back, you know, planting a tree in the garden to uh, counteract the carbon emissions of the flight. But then, you know, straight away we go off to Willie's and we go and buy a whole lot of food in single-use plastics and all of our efforts are undone. So that the net loss never goes away. Right up. Let me talk a little bit more psychology with you now. And this is understanding how we know what we know or think we know what we know. I'm going to give you this just to very quickly look at um, because it is probably the single biggest um, psychological uh, principle that we need to overcome. This, we are masters of rationalization as, as human beings. We can make any bad thing look okay uh, by just changing the facts around that. Well, it's all about looking at the inconsistencies in our own behavior. Um, we love to point out other people's failings and their lack of action. But as we sit here today, we can all accept that we have to do more to get past this. Now, cognitive dissonance is, of course, informed by our need for conformity. We want to fit in. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to be the odd one out. So moving into change, we never want to be the first one to do that. And yet we know that we are compelled to do that if we want to survive going forward. What then drives that is we've become a conspicuous consumption society. It's all about our material goods. And why do we do that? Well, we, we try and move our, extend our own mortality, so to speak, by filling our lives with, with all sorts of goods and services. And if they cost more and they're more exclusive, we like them even more. Because that says to us, you know, we're not going to die. We, I'm rich. I'm famous. You know, I can use medical science to extend my life. Well, all of that stuff needs resources. We need to dig them out of the earth. We need to turn them into products. So in an ironic sense, we're actually hastening our own demise by our, so, pro, um, by our own materialism. Sorry, I'm faltering for the word there. All right. The other thing that we also erroneously suffer from is, is what I call causality. We're always looking for causal connections. The problem here is that we tend to underestimate the big things and we overestimate the small things. So back again to our example of air travel, for example. You know, pre-COVID, it was normal to get on a plane and fly uh, for a business meeting, right? So we underestimate the carbon emissions that come out of that. Now we're all doing things virtually. And we've now discovered that we've overestimated the need to have contact uh, with each other, face-to-face -face contact, that is. So there's an example of how we can underestimate small things but over overestimate small things and underestimate big things. That lead, leads to this phenomenon where we start blaming the victims of, of misfortune. If you look at the yellow block, people operate under the assumption that people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. Well, that's okay if you in the top one, two, three, four, five percent, you can try and buy your way out of this problem. For the ones lower down the pyramid, they just take the hit. There's no way they can go. They can't escape it. But the irony is that climate change is actually democratic. It crosses national boundaries. You can't escape it by moving somewhere else or buying yourself a mountaintop and hoping that it's not going to hit you. So we're all in this boat together, even though we currently think along these lines. Then the other thing that also fits into this and drives a lot of our understanding and our activity as human beings is, is identity. We don't really understand who we are. And I'll explain a bit further with this, with this next graphic. We, we've moved now from what has been known as solid modernity. 
So if we look at our parents' generation, like, you know, 70s, 60s, 50s even, our grandparents, all the way up to the turn of the century, things were pretty solid in the sense that they were predictable. You know, you had a 40-year career, usually with the same company. You retired, you got your pension, your gold watch. You know, the future was pretty predictable. Not anymore for our generation and the ones to come. We've now moved into what we call liquid modernity. Everything's fluid, highly changeable, and therefore also uncertain. What then does that do uh, to us in terms of who we think we are? Well, we still believe that there are universal aspects to ourselves. We like to talk, think, smile, feel, dream. All people have these characteristics in common. Within our own individuality, we're comfortable with the fact that we're unique, got our own style, our own look. That does, doesn't give us any anxiety or discomfort in, in terms of how we deal with climate change going forward. The problem starts happening here um, in the middle band when we are in groups. And then we start having differences of opinion and behaviors. We see that in culture, ethnicity, gender, and so forth. We start talking about the they, the other over there. Our tribalism starts coming out. And there's a very nasty phenomenon that's starting to appear now around climate change. Um, and it's quite literally climate apartheid. I will give you an example. Um, the Bangladeshis live basically on a flat plain. The whole of Bangladesh is a very uh, low-lying area that has huge uh, water movement during the monsoon, not unlike some parts of Mozambique. So obviously, when climate starts changing rapidly, more rainfalls, more flooding, they need to get to higher ground, which is basically in India. So the Indian government has now put up a, a, a fence on the border, electrified fence, saying, no, um, Bangladeshis, you're not coming here, even if you're being flooded out. So we're starting to see these things happening all over the world now um, in terms of climate. So it becomes a basis for exclusion. You know, we start looking at how rich people are dealing with climate change versus um, middle class and working class people. We're starting to see a breakdown in, um, or we're starting to see conflict around ideology. Um, there's there's lots of uh, polemics right now around, you know, a socialist versus a capitalist approach to climate change. We're seeing power games taking place. You know, Donald Trump, our friend again, wanting to build a huge wall on his southern border. That's not going to help him with climate. Climate weather patterns are just going to go right across his wall. So it's kind of a doom and gloom picture sometimes when, when we look at this. But really, this band in the middle, this group activity band, is also where our liberation sits. Because if we can find each other there, and we really ought to, because that will save all of us, then we can turn this thing around. We can really move the conversation onto a higher plane, and we can, can say, what do we need to do globally about this? So if you consider what's currently happening with COVID, the lessons we're learning, well, each country has shut itself down and shut itself off. There's very little global collaboration and cooperation taking place. Now, if you consider that cartoon earlier on of, of the three waves, climate change being the big one, we need to learn from COVID very quickly if we're going to deal with that big wave. Because once COVID's over, climate change is still going to be there. It's, we're still going to have to deal with a larger problem. And that means we're going to have to start cooperating globally. We're going to have to get past group and tribal behavior. We're going to have to get past our love of national boundaries and nationalism. Right, so how do we do it? Easier said than done, you might be thinking right now. Well, we need to look towards our, our values now, you know, the morality of doing the greater good. So I love this quote by Viktor Frankl. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, um, he survived the Nazi death camps, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And basically, the, the, most fam the quote he's most famous for is that suffering ceases the moment, the moment it finds a meaning. 
And climate change is exactly the same. Once we make meaning out of climate change, once we acknowledge the fact that we are contributing to it happening um, and primarily being responsible for it, we can get to grips with it. We can start working on the problem. That also means that we're going to have to start understanding that change is going to be a constant for us going forward. We want psychological reorientation. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're going to have to look at climate leadership a bit differently. We're going to need more awareness and reflection. We have to go on an inner journey and start with the self. What am I doing about this? How do I feel about this? Then we can start looking at the second band. How am I going to relate this to my nearest and dearest? Then the, the interpersonal, the group level. How are we all going to coalesce around this? How are we going to do this at work, internally in our organizations? And then finally, how is that going to impact in our external environment? We also need to take purposeful and effective action around this. We can't just think our way conceptually through this problem. We've got to take, we've got to act. So, and we've got to do both of these at the same time. We're going to have to take an outside in approach as well as an inside out approach. You know, back to our three little questions, why, how, and what. This drives a lot of it. This is the why. This is how we need to take this forward to make it effective in terms of our output. But change and transition are not quite the same thing. And I'll show you why by making this comparison. So change is usually external and transition is internal. Yet they both happen at the same time. So when we look at climate change, we can see the wildfires, we can see the floods, the hurricanes. But how we feel about that is not visible. That's, that's an internal state that we need to deal with. And because it's internal, we have to tell each other how that feels. We can't read each other's minds and we can't certainly uh, feel each other's hearts. So our communication needs to take both into account if we're going to collaborate effectively around this. The next thing is that, you know, change is event driven, whereas transition is a felt and a lived experience. It's an internal journey, as I've described previously. It's a change again, situational whereas transition is psychological. Now you can start seeing how these binaries start stacking up with each other. So we're used to having an outcome-focused um, approach in business, whereas transition is, is a process-based approach. We, through COVID now and into the future dealing with climate change, we have become aware that the world of work needs to change drastically. We have to take care of people's emotional well-being as well as their material well-being we can't manage people like we used to uh, people don't want to work like they used to work and therefore if we extend that further out into the larger issue around climate we have to change our approach if this is going to work we can't use old old approaches and expect new outcomes and then ultimately change is something that we experience relatively quickly However, transition is gradual and slow. So climate change is going to be with us for a long time. It's going to take a concerted effort over a long period of time. And we need to get comfortable around that if we're going to deal with it properly. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. There are some weak signals starting to show up around change. And I'm using this uh, fossil fuel industry example for you. Why do we need to look at these two companies? Well, for the simple reason that Shell is in the process of writing off $22 billion worth of assets, stranded assets. They know they're not going to get that money back. BP also announced $17.5 billion. These are big numbers, even for companies this size. At the same time, they are furiously working at building strategies around climate risk. They're trying to predict when peak demand is going to happen, what's going to happen to those assets afterwards, how are they going to liquidate them. 
One of their big concerns, of course, is are the massive subsidies that they're receiving from governments all over the world and how they are going to replace that. So through my network, I believe that a lot of these fossil fuel companies are now actively trying to reposition for the green economy. They're rapidly moving their focus onto sustainable forms of energy. It's a little bit late. Um, it's a little but little at the moment, but we are starting to see change happening in areas where we would never have expected it even a year or two ago. However, there are lots of these assets out there that are going to tank and the industries that um, extract them are going to tank along with them. That means there are people that are going to suffer. There are lots of human beings that work in these companies that need to be retrained redeployed. We need to find a way not to throw those people out on the street. So we need to start looking at the knock-ons, you know, mining, logging, they're going to be up next um, as, as the oil majors start um, suffering and struggling. So yes, we can say that uh, we can get up on our soapbox and say the oil companies are bad, but they've given us a very comfortable life up till now. So we need to find a way to work with them to turn this around and to reintegrate all those people. So ultimately, folks, we are looking at moving to a higher uh, level of functioning as human beings. We're looking at being less judgmental and more problem-solving orientated. We need to find each other. We need to be better as human beings. We need to be more mature in, in dealing with this problem. So if one looks at the long arc of human history, we can say we're moving from adolescence into adulthood now. We have to grow up and we have to make the decisions that reflect that. So I've blasted through this because I've been quite concerned about time and I hope it's, it's made sense to you. I know this deck is going to be shared with you, but I've also wanted to leave some time at the end of this presentation to take some questions uh, from you. I always find that it's hugely valuable. So with your permission, I've put this on the screen, which are the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. It's a list of the actions that we need to take, where we need to focus. Um, and this focus is really, obviously, is, is very important from a perspective that we don't want to put our energy into something that's already failing. We want to put it into something that's going to replace it, that's going to take us to a better place. And this is the, this is the game plan. Now, they've been around since the Rio Earth Summit and through successive climate change conferences, global ones, we've seen very little policy um, action or action on policy. So I'm going to throw this open to all of you um, so that you can pose questions and that we can, um, I can maybe answer them for you um, as they relate to you personally. Now, I've, I'm reading something here, and excuse me, a question here is your opinion on COVID being good, oopsie daisy, on COVID being good for the planet? Well, let's look at it in this sense. It's a learning experience for all of us. So here we have this tiny little genetic material, this virus, and it's upset the apple cart completely. We obviously weren't prepared for it, even though we had the SARS virus um, a few years back. Um, that gave us the, the precursor experience to COVID. The only countries that prepared for it were the countries that were the hardest hit um, during the SARS virus outbreak. What does that tell us? It tells us that this, this virus is a teacher. It's saying, get prepared, there's worse to come. And if you're not prepared for that, your suffering is going to increase exponentially. Personally, I believe we need to start looking at um, taking an approach where life itself is primary as opposed to the human be species being primary. We need to start wrapping our heads around that idea 
that yes, we are the apex species on the planet. We have enormous power at our disposal, but then we also have enormous potential for doing harm. So let's learn from COVID. Let's learn the lessons, you know, help each other, find a way to carry our fair share, to right the wrongs of the past, to place ourselves on a, on a more level playing field where we can all bring our own unique contributions to the planet. So the next question I've got here is, will COVID change our behavior, social or environmental perspective? I think we've, we've just covered that. So I'm going to go on to the next question, which says, how as an individual can you work on trying to change practically? Well, this is something that we can put under the heading of personal mastery. Do you know yourself well enough? Do you question your beliefs often enough? Do you inform yourself adequately? Have you read and investigated anything around climate change? Who are you listening to on climate change? Um, what are your political beliefs, your religious beliefs around climate change? Everything is up for question now. We need to interrogate. We need to go into all of these aspects. And we need to do that primarily individually. But then we need to start sharing um, those learnings with each other. We need to start debating, conversing. But most of all, we need to enter into dialogue where we both speak and listen at the same time. We need to enlarge this conversation. And we need to make room for the for the fact that there may be and probably will be different opinions around all of this. But it's a good thing. It's not something to fear. It's nothing, not something to shy away from. We can beat this as long as we understand that it begins with us and we individually need to make ourselves better than, than we've been at the moment. So one aspect around this might be to start questioning whether our comforts are that important versus our survival. Do we need that beach house? Do we need those overseas holidays? Do we need to have those expensive German cars in the double garage? Well, Daniel Kahneman, who I referred to earlier on, did research on this. And he has established um, over the course of a longitudinal study that at the level of $100,000 a year, there's no added benefit in terms of well-being, emotional and otherwise, to a human being. So we, we hit a ceiling around $100,000, um, and that's our upper limit of, of material happiness that can translate into emotional well-being. Beyond that, it's just superfluous. You know, we find that we spend way too much time and attention um, if we earn more and buy more beyond that point. So uh, recent research has come out and it's now defined that the average South African household has 300,000 items in it. Now imagine the amount of attention and energy that you have to put towards all of those material goods. You know, finding that pair of scissors that you're looking for can take half an hour. If your memory is not good enough, you can spending a lot of time looking for something that you probably might not need. How many pairs of shoes can we wear at a time? And so forth and so on. So this is the kind of house cleaning and, and mental reorganization that we, that we all need to go through now in terms of uh, getting wiser and better uh, in terms of climate change. Right. Um, how can I help employees to transition and change? Well, fortunately, there are um, quite a few uh, programs that are starting to pop up. Not too many um, and not too deep. We tend to look at uh, climate change primarily um, through the quantitative lens at the moment. In other words, what is policy? Um, what do we need to do to be compliant and so forth? Regulation, governance and the like. Well, we in my opinion, we now need to put the human development on the same level as the, as the quantitative uh, side of things. 
we can't just keep on um, developing rules and regulations and policy frameworks if we don't understand that people are going to have to execute these things and that we have to help people transition. So the first step then, of course, is we have to inform people. We have to bring them to a central point where we take them through a process that explains um, all the factors that they have to deal with. We've got to help them deal with their emotions around this. You know, the minute you bring up emotion in a, in a kind of a business or a corporate context, it's almost like people want to pull back and say, well, that's not what we do here. We come here to work, uh, bank a check, um, we deal with our emotions at home. Well, we're no longer in that space anymore. COVID has taught us that, you know, if we are separated, we're working remotely, there's massive emotional and mental impact on that. So it's definitely um, a hidden cost that we haven't recognized and we haven't invested in. But now we're going to have to. There's, there's no way around that. So there are people and experts that can obviously help us deal with this. Right. So perhaps I can take one more. How can I participate as an individual to make an impact using the SDGs? I've seen only companies working towards it or reporting on it. Well, this is um, the whole ESG, environmental, social governance um, debate, has now proven to be a huge element um, in investment um, strategy. All companies now realize that they have to get on the front foot around us. They have to balance their impact on the environment with their investment decisions. And it's very simple. The shift is coming in the, in the consumer. People are getting very picky about what they buy and who they buy it from. So companies that produce goods and services are increasingly coming under pressure um, through the, the average consumer. We all want to feel good about the clothes we wear. We want to be able to say that they didn't come out of a sweatshop. You know, they weren't made um, as, a, as a result of a whole lot of shenanigans. We want to be able to say that, you know, the food that we eat is grown sustainably and healthily and organically. And this is no longer just a matter for um, the youth who are already predisposed to this. Everybody that's alive today has to pay special attention to this going forward. So there's a pressure bubble building up around this. And the decision makers at the top of, of the corporate or the business world and also on the top of the political world will now have to be cognizant of this way more than they used to be. We are starting to wake up and we are starting to raise our voices around this and therefore we have to get smarter about this we have to reach out we have to look at what the academic world is telling us we have to look at what the scientists are telling us and we have to say look even if they're only 80 percent right it's still enough to motivate us to change we're not going to solve all of this all at once or very soon we have to at least be willing to say we are involved in this. There are no U-turns we can make. There's no off-ramps we can take. There's no easy way out of this. Let's get on with the 80% that we are certain about, get the wheels turning, and then as we keep moving, we'll, we'll take care of the, the 20% that, that is still uncertain around this. So, folks, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, only a few um, minutes left. So maybe I can just wrap up by saying that blame, judgment, criticism around us is not going to work. What's going to work is to say we're in the same boat and the boat is leaking. Now, whether the hole in the bottom of the boat is a little bit more to one side than the other side really is immaterial. We are all in danger of going down with this boat if we don't start working together and rowing together. It's what we call lifeboat dynamics. It also means that for some folks who are in the water, we need to get them in the boat. They're not going to be able to tread water forever. And at the same time, we need to start 
pulling all the lifeboats together so that we can uh, take care of everybody. So thank you for your time and your attention. I'm going to kind of call it a day at this point. I hope I've been able to stimulate some thinking, and I hope that, um, that you all go and, and start having conversations wherever you are. You know, just with your nearest and dearest at home, you know, with your trusted colleagues at work, just start a conversation. A journey of a thousand miles always starts with, a, with one step. Have that conversation, share some ideas, get some information in how other people think. And let's, let's just get going. Let's start doing what we can. And pretty soon we'll realize that we can actually do a lot and that we can actually turn this thing around. Thank you for your time. I've been very happy to be here, and I hope that uh, I've made some impact for you today. Thank you.